We are very excited uh, to have Lola Thompson speaking this week, and she will be talking about counting quaternion algebras uh, with applications to spectral geometry. All right. Well, thank you all so much for inviting me. It's nice to be back in the US in some sense right now, even though I can't actually be back in the US. Um, so I wanted to start actually by giving a bit of an overview of what this talk is going to be about. And I'm going to use a lot of big words that I'm going to define later. So if you're not someone who works with spectral geometry, please don't be intimidated by this. Um, but just to kind of give you a sense of what goals we're working towards. So we want to ultimately prove effective versions of what are called rigidity results for arithmetic hyperbolic uh, two and three manifolds. And so by rigidity, what I mean is we want to understand kind of how much two manifolds need to have in common in order to be considered the same in some sense. So equivalent under some notion of equivalence. And um, I'll define carefully what I mean by arithmetic and hyperbolic two and three manifolds later on, because I realize that this is a number theory audience. And so these might not be objects you've encountered. Um, but maybe one thing to say is that Everything I'll do in this talk will be in the two manifold setting. So in other words, for surfaces. That said, everything that I tell you is also true in the three manifold setting. So the only difference in the proofs is that when you're dealing with two manifolds, your matrix groups are defined over the real numbers. And when you're dealing with three manifolds, they're defined over the complex numbers. And so to keep things a little simpler, I'm going to do everything over the reals. But if you're interested in three manifolds, just imagine doing everything over the complex numbers instead, and all the proofs work in exactly the same way. Um, so that's my spiel about kind of what this talk is about. Now, what does this have to do with number theory? Well, the nice thing is that there's actually this correspondence between maximal subfields of quaternion algebras and arithmetic or lengths of geodesics on arithmetic hyperbolic two and three manifolds. And so what this means, in other words, is I can have some kind of quantitative question about lengths of these geodesics on the geometry side. I can use this correspondence to translate it into a number theoretic question about maximal subfields of quaternion algebras. Then what I can do is I can use analytic number theory techniques to produce quantitative results. And then I can pass it back via this correspondence and get a quantitative answer on the geometric side. And so that's gonna be the key is really all the tools in this talk are gonna be number theoretic tools, but the types of questions we're gonna ask are gonna be motivated by the geometric side. And so in particular, some of my results with my co-authors on counting quaternion algebras might feel a bit unmotivated in the sense that you know, we're interested in counting quaternion algebras with some very particular properties. And so as a number theorist, you might wonder, well, why do we care about quaternion algebras with those properties? But the reality is that these properties are things that arise on the geometric side. And so by counting the specific types of quaternion algebras that we're gonna count on the number theoretic side, that's what's gonna give us the geometric results we care about. So everything is motivated by the geometry, but all the tools I'll mention will really be number theory tools. All right. So just to give you a sense of what I'm going to do today. Um, so I'll start by introducing quaternion algebras, just for those who aren't so familiar with them. And I'll define some basic things about these objects. And then I'll give a sample of some of our results on counting quaternion algebras. We actually proved a lot of different results on counting quaternion algebras for various geometric applications, but I'll focus on one in particular that I think is fun. Um, and then what I'll do is I'll give you some of the geometric background Again, because I know that not everyone here has experience with these spectral geometric questions. And then I will discuss how we construct these surfaces actually from quaternion algebras. And so this will be the part that connects the number theory part of the talk with the geometry part of the talk. Um, and then once I've done all that, I'll be ready to actually tell you what we've proven surfaces. I'll sketch some proofs. And then I'll end, if there's enough time, by discussing some connections to bounded gaps between primes. And actually, just from my own uh, knowledge, do I have 50 minutes or one hour? Because that, that affects maybe whether I get to bullet point six or not. Um, either one is fine, whichever, whichever okay. you're comfortable with, yeah. Yeah, we all Okay, well, we'll see. If I realize I can get through bullet point six, you know, and still finish in less than an hour, then I'll do that. And if not, then I'll refer you to my website. Um, but all right, let's go ahead and get started. And actually, before I say anything about our work, I should mention this is all based on joint work 
with Ben Linowitz, David Ben McReynolds, and Paul Pollock. So if I forget to say that later, I should say that now, but it's all joint with them. All right. So we'll start out with the basics about quaternion algebras. Um, and so we all know that Hamilton was the first person to sort of discover quaternion algebras. He looked at these R algebras that have basis one i j and i times j, and they have these defining relations where i squared is negative one, j squared is negative one, and then i times j is the same as minus j times i. And this he showed is a four-dimensional division algebra. So the cool thing about, there's like a nice story, of course, with this that probably a lot of people have heard, but um, the idea is that he was having a hard time figuring out how to multiply the quaternions. And then suddenly the idea came to him when he was crossing this bridge in Dublin called the Broom Bridge. And it turns out that to this day, if you go to Dublin, um, which there was an automorph automorphic forms workshop in Dublin, maybe in 2012 or 2013, and a bunch of us actually like took a bus to another bus, to a third bus, to the outskirts of Dublin, to this kind of seedy neighborhood. And then we saw this plaque on this bridge that actually commemorates, you know, it says uh, here as, I'm trying to read it, be walked by on the 16th of October, 1843, Sir William Rowan Hamilton in a flash of genius discovered the fundamental formula for quaternion multiplication. So that's what it says on this plaque. And so if you like mathematical tourism and you want to find this bridge that nobody in Dublin has ever heard of, except for the mathematicians, you can go and check it out next time you're in Dublin. Um, yeah, so anyway, I, think it's, I used to live a half hour walk from that bridge. Oh, perfect. Okay. Would you agree that most Dubliners have no idea what it is? Well, probably, yeah. Most I, I kept asking people for directions and they were like, Broom Bridge, what? Yeah, you know, so they, I had to like Google it. You're not wrong. That's not the best neighborhood hood up there though, too. <laughs> Yeah, anyway, it was pretty funny because I kept telling, you know, like the people in my hotel concierge or whatever, I need directions to the Broom Bridge. And they're like, why on earth would you want to go to that neighborhood? So anyway, um, that's just my fun historical fact. I'll get back to the math now. So anyway, um, rather than calling the quaternions H, which, you know, is nice because it's named after Hamilton, we're going to write minus one minus one R because it's something we can actually generalize a bit better. Um, and the reason we do this, of course, is because now rather than having, you know, just I squared be minus one and J squared be minus one, we could replace minus one with other numbers. And similarly, we don't just have to work over R, we could work over other fields of characteristic zero. So that's going to be the notation that I'm going to use. And uh, all right, so just to give an example, if we have minus one minus one R, then of course, by our definition that I said out loud, this means that I squared is going to be the same as j squared is going to be one. And then we still have the skew symmetry that i times j is equal to minus j times i. But then let's actually understand what this quaternion algebra looks like. So it turns out that actually one one r is isomorphic to um, the two by two matrices in r. And you can see this just by taking i and sending it to 0, 1, 1, 0, and then sending j uh, to 1, 0, 0, minus 1. And so if you're a student and you get lost in the talk and you want to check that isomorphism for fun, there's a like fun little exercise for you. Um, all right, so it turns out in general, actually, that ABR, this quaternion algebra, is always either isomorphic to Hamilton's quaternions if a and B are both less than zero. So in other words, it's division algebra, or it's isomorphic to the two by two matrices in R. Those are your only two choices. And so what this means then is, um, well, we can replace R with other fields if we want. And you might wonder, well, what happens if we replace R with other fields? Do we get more choices? And we actually have a theorem by Wedderburn, which says that if you have any field F, then if F, uh, is not a division algebra, then it must be isomorphic. ABF must be isomorphic to the two by two matrices in F. So your only choices are still either a division algebra or the two by two matrices over that field. Um, there's one important difference here though. So in the case of the real numbers, we only had one possible division algebra, which was Hamilton's quaternions. And in general, there won't be a unique division algebra over F. So in other words, you could get 
any one of a collection of division algebras, or you could get M2F for your quaternion algebra. But that's the only real difference. All right, so just like with other algebraic objects, we can do an extension of scalars of quaternion algebras. So for example, if we have a field K and we have a field extension K prime over K and you have a quaternion algebra B, which is defined as A B K, then if you take B and you tensor it with K prime over K, then you'll just get the quaternion algebra A, B, K prime. And so that's how we extend a, you know, the scalars in a quaternion algebra, which is by taking that tensor product. Um, so we won't be doing anything with that formally, but at various points, I'll just be mentioning that we're working in some field extension. And that's really what we're doing is we're really just thinking of taking the tensor product of whatever quaternion algebra we started with. But anyway, this is really just more for your edification to kind of understand how these objects work. Um, all right, so another piece of terminology that we need is if we have a quaternion algebra B over K and we look at BP, which is B tensored over K with KP. So you can think of this as like the p-adic integers, but where K is a number field. Um, then we say that B is actually ramified at prime P if BP is just the unique division algebra over KP. And otherwise, it means that B splits in P. So those are your only two choices, either it ramifies at P or it splits in P. And so this is again, analogous to terminology you see from algebraic number theory. But the reason that we care about this is we want to eventually be counting quaternion algebras by discriminant. And so I'm telling you this because I wanna tell you what a discriminant of a quaternion algebra is. And so what we do to define the discriminant is well, we define what we call ram of B which is the finite set of primes at which the quaternion algebra B is ramified. And then the discriminant of B is just the ideal that you get by taking the product of all the primes at which B is ramified. So just take the product of all these primes, you get the discriminant, and now you have some kind of uh, you know, well-defined object that you could use in order to order your quaternion algebra. So just like Bargava you know, and, and other people in this sort of arithmetic statistics stuff have, you know, ordered various arithmetic objects according to discriminant, we're going to do exactly the same thing here. All right, and I'm almost finished with terminology on quaternion algebras. I just want people to have this basic familiarity. Um, so one of the remaining things we need to know is what a reduced norm is. And so a reduced norm is just what you get when you take a composite map of taking the inclusion of B into the two by two matrices in C and then taking the determinant of that matrix. So in the end, you just get some kind of number out. Um, and so that's what we think of as the reduced norm. And then finally, last bit of terminology. Um, so we'll have K be a number field and OK be its ring of integers. And we'll say that the order of or an order of a K algebra is just a subring, which is also a finitely generated O sub K module that contains a K basis of the algebra. And we care really in this stuff about what are called maximal orders. And so an order is maximal just if it's not properly contained in any other order. Um, and so you don't really need to actually understand any of this. I'm just gonna use the term maximal order a bit later when I talk about constructing arithmetic surfaces from quaternion algebras, and so I wanted you just to be familiar with this word. But if this is a little bit, a little bit fast, that's totally fine. Um, just to give an example, though, because I like to give examples. So um, one example is that if we look at the two by two matrices in Z, well, this is actually a maximal order uh, of the two by two matrices in Q. So there's one example. Um, but like I said, this last bit of algebraic stuff is really just so that you at least know what these objects are that I'm talking about, but um, it's not terribly important for actually understanding the geometry. All right, so what I want to now do is tell you a little bit about what my co-authors and I did with counting quaternion algebras. And so what we did is we had a whole bunch of different questions, like I mentioned earlier, that were really motivated by the geometry. And so the type of problem I'm gonna pose for you now, I'll explain later in the talk kind of how it connects up with the geometry. But like I said, the um, sort of specific arithmetic uh, properties that we care about here might feel a little bit contrived just because you don't see the geometric connection right at this moment. Um, but let me go ahead and sort of tell you our theorem statement and tell you a little bit about kind of um, why our theorem is stated this way. So 
we fix a number field K and we fix some quadratic extensions L1 through LR of K. And we're gonna let L just be the compositum of all these quadratic extensions. And we have this extra hypothesis here, which is that the degree of L over K is two to the R. So in other words, what we're assuming is we're assuming that L has the maximum possible degree over K, right? There's no other dependencies among the L1 through LR so that you get the biggest possible degree you could expect if you have R of these field extensions. Um, so I'll say in a moment why we needed to have that maximal um, size, but I just wanted to make it clear that that's what that hypothesis is saying. All right. And so then what we prove is we prove that the number of quaternion algebras over our field K that have discriminant with norm less than X and that admitted beddings of all of these allies is asymptotically a constant times X to the one half over log X to the one minus one over two to the R. And our constant here, of course, depends on the field extensions and on the base field K, but it doesn't depend on anything else. All right, so let me now come back to this funny statement we had about L having maximal possible degree over K. So the reason that we care about this is if you don't have this condition, then it's possible that you might not have any quaternion algebra that admits embeddings of all of the LIs. And so this just kind of makes us avoid like stupid cases where we're counting quaternion algebras that don't actually um, you know, have the property that we, that we care about. Um, so anyway, it's important to avoid these interdependencies among the uh, quadratic field extensions and that's why we have that thing in there. And what we'll see later on in this talk is actually that these specific quadratic extensions correspond to specific geodesic lengths. And so if we're trying to guarantee that our our manifolds that we're looking at have certain geodesic lengths on them, then that's where we're going to care about prescribing these quadratic extensions. So that's where that's going to come up. And I'll, I'll repeat this later when I get to the geometric part. All right, so I want to give you a, just a sketch of how we prove this. Um, so, and this actually just uses some classical ideas from analytic number theory in the beginning. And so I'll start with those and then I'll talk about where more of the modern math comes in. Um, but the general thing that one could always try to do if one's trying to count arithmetic objects is one could do something like create a Dirichlet series whose coefficients count the objects you want to count. So in particular here, our Dirichlet series is counting the quaternion algebras with the types of properties that we're interested in. Um, and then there are these results called Talbirian theorems, which actually let us take the Dirichlet series and obtain an asymptotic for the partial sums of its coefficients. And so let me just kind of tell you, this is one particular Talbirian theorem called Delange's Talbirian theorem, but there are a whole bunch of different Talbirian theorems you could try to use. Um, but what Delange's Talbirian theorem says is if you have a Dirichlet series, an over n to the s, which has nice analytic properties. So in other words, it converges when the real part of s is bigger than some parameter rho, and you can analytically continue it um, on the closed half plane when you're um, at least as big as rho, things like that, you know, allowing for some singularities. So if you have kind of nice analytic properties of your Dirichlet series, then what it tells you is that you actually can get this asymptotic formula for the sum of the coefficients of your series. And so this is really nice because, you know, it gives you an honest to goodness asymptotic and the main work is just checking that all these analytic conditions are, are, are true. And then once you confirm the analytic conditions, then Belange actually gives you what the asymptotic should be. And notice how the parameters rho and beta sort of depend on the convergence properties of your series. Um, and so that's really where like, so what, what I'm getting here from Delange's Talbirian theorem is I'm getting some constant times x to some power rho times log x to some power beta minus one. And the rho and the beta are coming exactly from, you know, things like where the series converges, that's our rho. And the beta is, is basically like the order of a pole um, for our series, except for the fact that um, it's not quite a pole because it could kind of be any singularity, but you can sort of think about it that way, just keeping in mind that the beta is not necessarily an integer. That's the main caveat there. Um, but basically, once you check all these analytic conditions and make sure that they hold, then you apply it to your Dirichlet series, and then you get this asymptotic, 
And so that's my recipe for kind of how you get the sort of asymptotic. Um, the hard work here is really in actually constructing the Dirichlet series so that the coefficients actually count what you want to count. And then, you know, checking the analytic conditions is sort of just standard analysis kind of arguments. So that part's not so hard. So all of this is very classical analytic number theory. Now, let me say a bit about where more modern ideas come in. Um, so we end up using some results from class field theory, which say that if you have a quaternion algebra B over K, and if you have a quadratic extension L over K, then actually L is gonna embed into B if and only if no prime of K that divides the discriminant of B splits in L over K. And so remember we had this list L1, L2 through LR of quadratic extensions that we wanted to embed into our quaternion algebra. So really what we're trying to do is we're trying to understand the splitting behavior of primes in K um, of primes that divide the discriminant of B, you know, and trying to see how they split in L over K. And so you might worry a bit that maybe there's some interdependency among the splitting behavior, right? Because you kind of want to like do this separately for each of the quadratic extensions and then just kind of glue it together. That's what we wanted to do, but we were worried like maybe these events are sort of not independent. And it turns out actually that you can use this really deep result of Melanie Matchett Wood which says that we can model the splitting of finitely many primes as mutually independent events over the class of random quadratic extensions of K. And so that let us then handle each of these extensions L1 through LR separately, put it all together, and then incorporate that into the Dirichlet series um, argument that I had on the previous slide. So that's the rough idea. So basically kind of classical analytic number theory, but souped up with this result of Melanie Matchett Wood and some work from class field theory. Um, so that gives you a rough idea of what goes into our quaternion counting arguments. But what I wanna do now is talk to you a bit about what this says in a geometric setting. And so this is where, um, keep in mind, I'm not a geometer, but if I'm saying anything that's uh, kind of too quick, please feel free to stop me on the geometry questions because I realize I'm speaking for a number theory audience. And if I know how to answer the question, I will. And if it's some deep geometric thing, then I might refer you to a book. Um, but all right, so geometric motivation. Um, throughout this, we're going to be talking about Riemannian manifolds. So manifolds where you have a Riemannian metric. So we can actually think of things as having a notion of length. And so we'll define a closed geodesic just to be a map from the circle to the manifold. And this map has to locally yield the shortest distance between two points. And so I'll draw you some examples of manifolds now. And uh, again, keep in mind, I'm not a geometer, so I'm really, really bad at drawing these things, but I'll do the best I can. So the only manifold I'm really good at drawing is the torus. Um, but here are three examples of tori. And so if we wanted to look at geodesics on the torus, well, one example is just the closed loop that you get by going around the torus. Another example is if you went around the torus kind of in the other way, like that, um, and then the last option, and this is the one where I'm going to be lying to you a little bit, just because I'm really bad at drawing these things. But basically you go, uh, oops, and I'm accidentally erasing too. You go around the torus, and then you can kind of go down and behind and then emerge on the other side. But this doesn't actually look like a geodesic. It doesn't look like it locally yields the shortest distance between two points. But I promise you that there is a closed loop you could create that goes both around and through the torus. Um, I'm just, I have not yet mastered how to draw this, so I apologize for that. Um, all right, so there are two types of spectra that we're going to care about in this talk. There's first off what's called the Laplace eigenvalue spectrum, which we'll denote with an E of M. And this is just the multi set of eigenvalues of the Laplacian of M. And so when I say multi set, I mean we could have the same eigenvalue showing up multiple times. And the same thing with the geodesic length spectrum. So this is gonna be denoted LS of M. And this is gonna be the multi-set of lengths of closed geodesics on M. So in our work, we're gonna care more about the geodesic length spectrum, LS of M. But I'm mentioning the Laplace eigenvalue spectrum because some of the historical results that I'm gonna mention are done in terms of Laplace eigenvalue spectrum instead. Um, so I just wanted to make it clear that there actually are two types of spectra that people look at, and we're going to care more about LS, but 
I'll mention E a little bit as well. All right, so I said earlier in my talk that we're gonna care about trying to show when two manifolds are the same in some sense, um, you know, showing that if they have a lot of properties in common, this actually forces them to be equivalent. And so now I'm gonna tell you about three notions of equivalence that we're gonna care about. Um, so one of these notions of equivalence is called commensurability. And so we say that manifolds M and N are commensurable if they have a common finite degree covering space. And then we say that they're called isometric if there's an isometry or a distance preserving linear transformation between them. And then finally, we say that they're isospectral if the Laplace eigenvalue spectra coincide and then their length isospectral if the geodesic length spectra coincide. Um, so these are three notions of equivalence that we care about and in our talk, we're mostly going to care about commensurability, um, but some of the historical results in this field that I'm now going to talk about are going to involve isospectrality. And so I wanted to now um, kind of tell you a little bit of like a bigger view, like a zoomed out view of, of this field and what kinds of questions people are interested in, just to give some context. So these are coming from an area called inverse spectral geometry. And so natural inverse questions that one might ask are things like, well, to what extent do the spectra of a manifold determine its geometry and topology? And so one question you could think about asking is, okay, if the geodesic length spectrum of M is the same as the geodesic length spectrum of N, so in other words, M and N have the same geodesic lengths, does that mean that the two manifolds are isometric? Or similarly, if we know the two manifolds have the same geodesic lengths, are they necessarily commensurable? And so this is something that um, I'm now going to tell you a little bit more about. So maybe I'll tell you the answers to these questions and then I'll actually kind of go through the theory. Um, so geodesic length spectra coinciding, meaning M and N are isometric, that actually is not true. And this is like a famous problem from spectral geometry that I'll now tell you a little bit about. Um, this other question about, you know, if the lengths are the same, are they necessarily commensurable? It actually has two different answers, or rather it has one answer and one kind of question mark. So um, there are two types of manifolds that we're going to care about. There are what are called arithmetic manifolds. And then there are what are called non-arithmetic manifolds. And so in the arithmetic setting, the answer is yes. If your manifolds have the same geodesic lengths, they actually do have to be commensurable. In the non-arithmetic setting, we actually have no idea still. That's an open question. And so my talk is really like the work that I do with Ben, Ben and Paul is really gonna focus on this arithmetic situation. Um, but I just wanted to mention that, you know, in the non-arithmetic case, we still have absolutely no idea whether or not this is true. Um, but just for a bit of historical kind of context, I wanted to talk about this first question, the one where if the geodesic lengths are the same, does that mean that they're isometric? So um, we have this problem that was posed by Leon Green in 1960, which asks if the spectrum of a manifold determines its isometry class. And so one way of thinking of the spectrum of a manifold is you can think of it like a collection of frequencies produced by a drum head shaped like your manifold. And so then this problem was actually popularized by Mark Katz in 1966 in the setting of planar domains. And so he kind of rephrased this question of Leon Green to say, can you hear the shape of a drum? In other words, do there exist isospectral but non-isometric planar domains? That's the fancy way of saying that. And so this question, okay, notice it was posed in 1960 and popularized in 1966. This was actually in a monthly article in 1966. So it's actually a very readable paper. Um, it wasn't answered until 1992. And in 1992, Gordon and Webb, and then separately Walpert showed that no, you actually can't hear the shape of a drum. And so again, to put it into our language here, this means that isospectral does not imply isometric. Um, and so you can actually see an example here. I'll try to zoom it in. Hopefully that doesn't make the 
pixelation terrible. I think it's fine. Um, so you can actually see in my left picture of Gordon and Webb. So um, they're wearing a pair of t-shirts and on their t-shirts, they have a pair of isospectral non-isometric planar domains. And then they're also holding a pair of cardboard cutouts, which are different from what's on the t-shirts. And that's another pair of isospectral but non-isometric planar domains. And so here are two concrete examples of you know, differently shaped drums um, and apparently they sound the same. So anyway, that's a uh, nice, I, I thought, I just thought this was great when I found this web picture of them and I realized what was actually going on in the photo. I thought that was really cool. So anyway, so, so that answers our first question from the first page. The fact that the geodesic lengths are the same does not imply that the manifolds are actually isometric. Um, now what I wanna do before I get to that second inverse question, the one that we're actually focusing on, I wanna now tell you a little bit about hyperbolic surfaces and also what it means for a manifold to be arithmetic because these are two vocabulary words that I put in my first slide that I promised I would define a little bit better. So here we go. Um, so the hyperbolic plane, which we'll denote with an H2, is just a simply connected surface that has constant curvature negative one and you can model it by the unit disk. And so I've given here this picture from MC Escher. This is the circle limit four. And it turns out actually that um, if you look at the, so you can look at the symmetries of this diagram where you map any angel to any other angel or where you map any devil to any other devil. And this actually forms the group of isometries acting on the hyperbolic plane. And so that's kind of a cool example from art um, of, you know, sort of showing this, this hyperbolic plane phenomenon, which I thought was pretty neat. And also since I work in the Netherlands now, I felt the need to put in a picture from the Netherlands. So there you go. Um, all right, so hyperbolic, the hyperbolic situation actually, um, in terms of that, can you hear the shape of a drum question has been known for a bit longer than the planar domain version. So in fact, actually Vinyura in 1980 showed that there exists isospectral but non-isometric hyperbolic two and three manifolds. And the way that she proved this actually was by using examples that like she, she actually, you know, generated examples of, you know, two uh, hyperbolic two manifolds, for example, that are isospectral but non-isometric and same for the three manifold version. And she actually constructed her examples uh, using orders from quaternion algebras. So that's where the orders from quaternion algebras are coming into this work now. Um, one example, if you like concrete examples and talks, I thought I would give you a concrete example of uh, isospectral but non-isometric hyperbolic two orbifolds. And so the way that you can construct these orbifolds from this piece of paper is you collapse along the dotted lines and you glue the semicircles of the same color on top of one another. And if you do that, then you'll produce these two orbifolds. And it turns out that these are isospectral but non-isometric. You have no way of telling that just from looking at this picture, but I just wanted to show that such examples do exist. And uh, you know, if you have any, if you're good at imagining what these things look like, which I'm not, then maybe you could try to understand it. But I, I think this is probably a pretty unenlightening example. I mostly just wanted you to see there are concrete examples that people have worked out. They're just maybe not so friendly uh, to understand. Um, anyway, so now that we know a little bit about hyperbolic surfaces, I wanna talk about what it means for a surface to be arithmetic. And so in order to do this, I'm gonna need some elementary results from geometric group theory. Um, and so one of the elementary results that we need is that the orientation preserving isometries of the hyperbolic uh, two, two plane is isomorphic to PSL2 of R. So that's just gonna be something we take as a black box. I put this in a black box on purpose. Um, or a gray box, I guess. And uh, the other thing is that every orientable hyperbolic two manifold is of the form H2 mod gamma for some discrete subgroup gamma of PSL2R. And so we're just gonna assume these things are true. Um, if you wanna know more about this, you can check out a book by McLaughlin and Reed, which has all these great results in the first couple of chapters. But anyway, the idea then for constructing arithmetic manifolds is the following. So we're gonna kind of imitate this sort of strange construction of PSL2R 
where you start with the two by two matrices in Q, and then you restrict to just the ones defined over Z. And then you look at the ones that have determinant plus or minus one, and then you identify one and minus one to get PSL2Z. And so we can do kind of the same thing, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna replace M2 of Q with the quaternion algebra. So we will replace this with a uh, quaternion algebra B over K. Um, and this is gonna have to quaternion algebra and show unique real prime splits. All right. And then similarly, we'll replace M2 of Z with a maximal quaternion order, order of B. So replace with maximal um, quaternion order O of B. All right. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to think about the embedding that I'm calling rho here, which goes from our quaternion algebra B into the two by two matrices in R. And if we restrict it just to the uh, maximal quaternion order O with reduced norm one. So we're looking at the elements of O that have reduced norm one. That's what this is here, is elements of O with reduced norm one. Um, and then if we project this map onto PSL2R, then this actually gives us an embedding of you know, from our uh, maximal order with uh, reduced norm one into PSL2R. So that's what's going on here is we're getting this, this induced map row bar. And uh, row bar is nice because if you take row bar and you apply it to O1, well, that's actually a discrete subgroup of isometries that have finite co-volume. And it's also true that um, the quaternion algebra B, since it's a quaternion algebra, it turns out that rho bar of O1 is going to be co-compact. And these are, again, just basic geometric group theory type results that come from McLaughlin and Reed. Um, and then finally, if rho bar of O1 is torsion free, then it turns out that H2 mod rho bar of O1 is going to be a hyperbolic two manifold. And so see that we're getting then a hyperbolic two manifold by taking, you know, the hyperbolic surface that we started with and then modding out by this image of this map. So, okay, the whole point of this is telling you what it means to be arithmetic. So it turns out that all of the hyperbolic surfaces that are commensurable to things of this form turn out to be arithmetic. So maybe I'll just write that down. So hyperbolic surfaces that are commensurable uh, two things of this form are arithmetic. And so that is how we construct an arithmetic manifold. And that is what arithmetic manifolds have to do with quaternion algebras, quaternion orders, quaternion order elements with reduced norm one, et cetera. That's why I mentioned all that in the beginning. And so that is the big connection between quaternion algebras and their related objects and these arithmetic surfaces. So anyway, if that was all really quick, that's fine. It's actually not super important for understanding the rest of the talk. I just mostly wanted people to actually see that connection. Um, so now let me say a bit of background about the problem that we were interested in, and then I'll spend the remaining 15 to 20 minutes talking about what we actually prove and a little bit about how we prove it. So. I mentioned earlier in my list of inverse questions, there's this question that if two manifolds have the same geodesic lengths, are they necessarily commensurable? And so this question was actually answered by Alan Reed in 1992. He showed that if M is an arithmetic hyperbolic surface and it has the same geodesic lengths as another arithmetic hyperbolic surface N, then it turns out that M and N are necessarily commensurable. And the same result was proven in the three manifold case um, this time it was Chinberg, Hamilton, Long, and Reed, and that was in 2008. So we already knew that having exactly the same geodesic lengths implied commensurability. 
But on the other hand, I want to contrast it with this result by Fooder and Millichap. So Fooder and Millichap showed that you can have pairs of, in this case, it's three manifolds, but the result also holds for two manifolds. So you can have pairs of finite volume hyperbolic three manifolds where the volumes are the same. They have the same complex length spectrum up to N, so some point N. They have a lot of closed geodesics up to length N. So they have a huge number of these overlapping geodesic lengths, but their, their result shows you can have a whole lot in common between these two manifolds but still fail at commensurability. And their examples actually arose from non-arithmetic manifolds. But what my co-authors and I were sort of interested in knowing is, well, okay, what about in the arithmetic setting? Can we show that there are a lot of manifolds where you have a whole lot of overlap in the geodesic length, but they're still not commensurable? So that was one thing we were interested in is kind of understanding, you know, what the count looks like of pairwise non-commensurable arithmetic uh, hyperbolic two manifolds that have a lot of overlapping geodesic lengths. That's the second question that I've listed here on my motivating questions. Um, the first question we are interested in, which I'll just touch on briefly, is we wanted to make Reed's result effective. And so in other words, we wanted to show that um, okay, if the geodesic lengths on two manifolds agree up to a certain point, then they're necessarily commensurable. So in other words, we wanted to show that some finite portion of the length spectrum determines commensurability here, as opposed to needing all infinitely many geodesic lengths to be the same. Um, and so that's what I'm gonna now talk about is I'll first mention how we make Reed's result effective. So that's the first bullet point. And then I will talk a little bit about how many of these pairwise non-commensurable manifolds are there with a whole lot of overlapping geodesic lengths. All right, so our result on surfaces is the following. Um, and there's a similar type of thing that you can do with three manifolds. So Burrell proved this result that we refer to as his finite risk result. And it says that if you have a non-negative real number V, then there are only finitely many arithmetic hyperbolic two manifolds of volume at most V. And as a consequence of his result, you can actually show that there then has to be some non-negative number L of V, where if M and N are arithmetic hyperbolic surfaces that have area at most V, and they have the same geodesic lengths up to L of V, then it turns out that M and N are commensurable. So this is what Burrell already showed. He showed that theoretically there should be some point at which once the geodesic lengths agree, you know, up to that point, then it forces commensurability. But we wanted to show this happens at some finite point. We wanted to give an upper bound for L of V. And then that would imply then that after you check all the geodesic lengths up to our upper bound, then you're guaranteed commensurability between these manifolds. And so this is what I meant earlier in my talk when I talked about trying to get a rigidity result on these, these objects and make it effective. So we're trying to get a quantitative um, bound on what forces you know, the sort of sameness here of these two manifolds. All right, so what we ended up showing is the following. Um, again, we're dealing with arithmetic hyperbolic surfaces. And so if we have two that have area at most V, then we could actually show that if all the geodesic lengths agree up to some constant times e to another constant times log v times v to the 130, then in fact that forces them to be commensurable. So that's the upper bound that we gave for L of v. And uh, so, like I said a few minutes ago, the remarkable part here is that we were able to show that some finite portion of the length spectrum determines its commensurability class. That's the good news. The bad news is we have no idea how good our upper bound is, and we suspect it's probably not very sharp at all. Um, so if you look back at that result of Fooder and Millichap that I mentioned, and actually this is a slightly related result from their paper, um, it actually gives a lower bound, which is linear in V. So we know that L of V is at least something that's linear in V versus our upper bound is something that's super polynomial in V. So we know the truth is somewhere between linear and super polynomial. Um, presumably their lower bound is not that close to the truth because 
um, they have kind of a constructive argument and they just generate families of examples and they probably aren't generating anything close to all the families of examples. So anyway, the best we can say right now is that um, we know the truth is somewhere between linear and V and polynomial and V, a super polynomial and V, and we have no idea exactly what the shape of that function is. But like I said, the good news is we know some finite portion of the length spectrum determines the commensurability class. So anyway, that was the first result I wanted to mention. Um, the one I wanted to talk about for the rest of my talk is the second result. So I wanted to remind you of what we discussed earlier in this talk on the number theoretic side. So this was the result for counting quaternion algebras that have a specific prescribed list L1 through LR of quadratic extensions that embed into it. And then we got this asymptotic using a Talberian theorem. So here is the geometric analog. So we define a counting function, pi of Vs, which is the maximum cardinality of a collection of pairwise non-commensurable arithmetic hyperbolic two orbifolds, which of course are derived from quaternion algebras and have bounded volume, volume at most V, and geodesic length spectrum containing S. So S here is just some finite set of geodesic lengths. So say S is like little l1 up to little lr. So in other words, we're counting pairwise non-commensurable manifolds that have these prescribed geodesic lengths, little l1 through little lr. Both of these manifolds have these lengths in their geodesic length spectrum. And we want to know how many of them are there. Well, we end up proving that this count is somewhere between a constant times v over a power of log v and another constant times v over a different power of log v. And so I'll say a little bit about how we actually prove this result. And then maybe something to be thinking about here is that this is a little bit like Chebyshev's inequality for the prime numbers. And so it's kind of interesting because it's saying that, you know, not only are there infinitely many of these pairwise non-commensurable manifolds with prescribed overlapping geodesic lengths, but actually the count of them is something like the count of primes, which is kind of fun for a number theorist. Um, so let me say a little bit about how we actually prove this. Maybe one quick comment to make is the reason we have this condition here that pi of Vs tends to infinity with V, that's really just to avoid the situation where you choose your set S in a stupid way so that maybe there are no orbifolds with those prescribed lengths. You know, you don't want to be like counting something where this never happens. And so again, this is kind of like the non-stupidity clause in our, our hypotheses here. Um, all right, so let's give a brief sketch for how we prove that our counting function for these pairwise non-commensurable manifolds grows like pi of x sort of. Um, so what we will do is we will let m uh, just be an arithmetic hyperbolic two manifold. And it's going to be one arising from a quaternion algebra. So it'll rise from a quaternion algebra B and a base field K and with fundamental group. Uh, so we'll just call it gamma and gamma because we're in the two manifold setting, it'll live inside of PSL two of R. And again, if we were dealing with three manifolds, it would be inside PSL2 of C instead. All right, so one important thing here is that there's actually a bijection. And this bijection is between these geodesics C sub gamma, which remember are maps from the circle to our manifold. And then these uh, conjugacy classes, little gamma sub gamma, where little gamma lives in our fundamental group. And so these conjugacy classes are just conjugacy classes of hyperbolic elements, little gamma that lives inside of gamma. Okay. So there's this nice thing where we actually have an explicit formula for the geodesic lengths. The geodesic lengths just look like the following. 
uh, geodesic lengths just look like, okay, if you take the hyperbolic cosine of the length of your geodesic gamma and divide it by two, then it should be plus or minus the trace of your hyperbolic element gamma divided by two. Um, and so in other words, if you really wanted to know explicitly what your geodesic lengths look like, well, you take the inverse hyperbolic cosine and then multiply by two. Um, so anyway, that's a useful formula for kind of seeing the relationship now between these, you know, matrices, which are hyperbolic elements, and actual geodesic lengths. All right. And so now what we will do is we will let lambda sub gamma, um, this is just going to be the unique eigenvalue of your hyperbolic element gamma which has the absolute value of lambda sub gamma greater than one. Um, maybe I'll pause for a minute and say why there's only one eigenvalue of gamma with this property. Well, remember that we are in PSL2R, so we're gonna have two eigenvalues because our characteristic polynomial has degree two. And so, um, and because we're in PSL2R, our determinant is plus or minus one, on the other hand, whenever you have hyperbolic elements, it turns out this is another result from geometric group theory that the absolute value of the trace of the hyperbolic element has to be greater than two. And so in essence, you're asking this question, well, how do we get two numbers that multiply to plus or minus one? Let's say positive one, just to keep things easier. So how do we find two numbers that multiply to positive one and that add up to something greater than two? Well, then one of those numbers has to be greater than one in absolute value, and one of them has to be smaller than one. And so that's why we have a unique eigenvalue that has absolute value greater than one here. And so now the thing is, let me show you how we actually construct our maximal subfields from this information. So notice that each of these closed geodesics, uh, C sub gamma, is then going to determine a maximal subfield. Um, and I'm going to call this K sub gamma of the quaternion algebra B. And you might wonder, well, how does it does how does it do that? Well, we just take K sub gamma and define it to be what you get when you take the base field K and you adjoin lambda sub gamma. And that's all you have to do. So you take K, you adjoin this lambda sub gamma, which is the unique eigenvalue with absolute value greater than one. And then you get this field K sub gamma. And it turns out that that's gonna be a maximal subfield of your quaternion algebra. And so this is exactly then how we get this correspondence between the geodesic lengths, little L1 through little LR, and our uh, quadratic extensions, capital L1 through capital LR. And so that's why we had that condition that we needed all those embeddings into a quaternion algebra and why we counted quaternion algebras that had those prescribed embeddings because we wanted to then force our manifolds to have these geodesic lengths in their geodesic length spectrum. Um, so here's that same result again. I just wanted to repeat it to remind you of where we just, where we just got. Um, and so in the last five minutes of the talk, I want to now kind of exploit this connection with the prime numbers a bit. You know, it's sort of interesting that these pairwise non-commensurable manifolds with prescribed geodesic lengths, um, you know, have a similar counting function to the count in primes. And so we wanted to explore that a bit more. Um, and so what we ended up proving is that you can actually get bounded gaps between manifolds in some sense. Um, well, in what sense can there be gaps between manifolds? Well, it turns out we can get bounded gaps between the volumes of the manifolds. That's the kind of measure we wanted to use there. Um, so what we end up proving is, again, if you have the same non-triviality condition that pi of Vs tends to infinity with V, then we can find infinitely many K tuples, M1 through Mk, of arithmetic hyperbolic two orbifolds, which are, again, pairwise non-commensurable, same condition as before, have these geodesic lengths, little L1 through little LR that you prescribed, and that have a bounded distance between their volume. And so, like I said, in the last couple of minutes of the talk, maybe I'll just explain 
how this connects with the bounded gaps between primes problems because it actually uses that as a crucial tool. Um, so very briefly, the way that we do this is we use something called Borel's covolume formula. Borel's covolume formula gives us the volume of a manifold. And it gives that volume in terms of kind of a bunch of different parameters. The thing to notice here is that the first collection of parameters all depend on your base field K. And the second collection of parameters that you're multiplying, these depend on your quaternion algebra. And so, so Borel's covalent formula says that, in other words, if you have two orbifolds um, that have the same field of definition K, But maybe their associated quaternion algebras ramify at different primes. So B, remember, is a quaternion algebra. So their associated quaternion algebras ramify at different primes. Um, then what this means is that their volumes are going to differ by some function of the norm of those primes. Because notice how you know, everything we have on the right hand side is just some product of norms of primes minus one. And so that's going to be what gives you the difference between the volumes. Everything in this first part here is going to be exactly the same. And so then what this means, in other words, just to kind of summarize the moral of the story, is that primes with gaps between them They actually produce orbifolds with volumes lying in bounded length intervals. So yeah, primes with gaps between them produce uh, orbifolds uh, with volumes that are lying in bounded length intervals. So it almost seems like we've proven the result that we want just with this Borel covolume formula, but there's one crucial ingredient missing. And so the thing that is missing is we need the orbifolds to have this length spectra containing S. Right, we haven't ever prescribed some set of geodesic lengths that, that come in here, and so we need to work that in now. Well, how do we end up getting uh, orbifolds with length spectra containing S? Well, we will get this if and only if the quadratic extensions K gamma embed into the quaternion algebras B. So this happens if and only if the quadratic extensions K sub gamma embed into the quaternion algebra as B. And so how do we end up kind of taking this into account? Well, we can arrange this um, by choosing primes that ramify in B that lie in certain Chebotarev sets. Oops, can arrange this by choosing So in other words, what this means is we need bounded gaps between primes in Shepitarov sets. Well, the good news is Jesse Thorner proved such a result. Um, since I'm basically out of time, maybe I won't say anything about his result. Basically just, you know, you can fix a Galois extension of a number field, you can fix a Galois group G, you can fix a discriminant, and you can fix a conjugacy class of your Galois group. And then you can show that there are infinitely many pairs of primes that 
you know, have these properties, in other words, where their uh, conjugacy class of Frobenius automorphisms of these primes coincide with the conjugacy class C that you said, et cetera, et cetera. So you can basically get this set of primes um, where, you know, you're guaranteed to have bounded gaps between these sets of primes infinitely often. And so that's what Jesse Thorner showed. There are tons of really fun examples of Shevatarov sets, which I'm out of time, so I won't really get into them, but I'll just flash the slide for one second to show that um, some Charpatarov sets of primes have things to do with the Ramanujan on tau function with the count of FP rational elliptic curves over a finite field FP, et cetera, et cetera. So there are tons of cool examples of Shevatarov sets. But the downside is that Jesse's result wasn't quite strong enough for ours. And so what we needed to then do was generalize Jesse's results. So his results is for Galois extensions k over q. And we needed to have Galois extensions of number fields over other number fields where the base field isn't necessarily q. And so the last component of our work then was generalizing Jesse's work so that we could have any number field as our base field. Um, so anyway, I'll go ahead and end my talk there because I know I'm out of time. But I just wanted to give you that flavor for um, kind of how gaps between primes, and in particular, generalizing a result of Jesse Thorner's on gaps between primes and Shevatarov sets, actually gives us gaps between volumes of these pairwise non-commensurable manifolds with certain prescribed geodesic lengths. Um, so thank you very much for your attention. Uh, yeah, that's up. Thanks. Let's let's thank Lola for her talk. That was really interesting. Um, are there any questions? Well, I was wondering about the Chebitarov or Chebyshev uh, type inequalities that you have. Yes. Um, and you mentioned the analogy to like the prime number theorem. Is it expected that there's actually an asymptotic? And if so, is there like a guess on what integer R or S? Is there like a way to guess what integer it might be? So our method didn't actually uh, really let us do like, OK. Our method made it so that the little r and little s had to be different, and we didn't have any good way of sort of pushing them together. Um, and we also, of course, have no idea whether the limit should exist anyway. Even if even if we had a good guess of what the right order of magnitude was, of course, the hard part in proving the prime number theorem was actually getting the limit to exist. And I think yeah. that would be quite hard with our methods. Um, but it would be cool if it could be proven. Um, yeah, we didn't really have much hope for it, <laughs> given what we did. <laughs> uh, yeah, there, a, go ahead. There's not a way to tell if um, you expect the limit to exist or not, because it's not like the prime number theorem where you can easily compute the exact numbers. And Yeah, I mean, so of course, like most proofs of the prime number theorem where you're actually like getting that limit meant to exist, you know, are quite complicated involving like an analytic or like there's there's like a fair amount of like analysis going in there, let's just say, right? Um, and I don't know, it would be somewhat hard to push, push through with our methods. So we have a precise asymptotic, of course, on the number theoretic side for counting the quaternion algebras with the embeddings. But when we translate it over to the geometric side, some additional imprecision gets introduced. And I don't know that it's possible to avoid that issue. And as a result, I don't know that any of the analysis kind of stuff would go through. Um, mm -hmm. So that's that's where my fear is. Is kind of like we produced as as you know we we produced an honest to goodness analytic analytic result you know asymptotic result on the number theoretic side, and then you know when the geometers then played around with it, suddenly it was not nearly as precise as what we gave them. And I. I I think that there's enough, um, you know, sort of stuff that they end up having to like work in there that that kind of prevents there from being any hope, at least, of of doing it this way and kind of getting a precise asymptotic. Okay. I know that was kind of a vague answer. I don't really want to get into all the geometric translation that goes on, but um, yeah, I'll just I'll just say that I don't think that it's something where you could very easily uh, have any hope of getting a limit there. Yeah. Any other questions? I have a, so on the number theoretic side, you said to get this asymptotic, the first step is to construct some Dirichlet series and then prove that it has some nice properties to plug into the Tauberian uh, theorem. Is this Dirichlet series, like, is it the Mellon transform of something nice or automorphic or uh, is that unclear? 
I, I actually have no idea. We, we <laughs> that isn't something that we looked at at all. Um, no, uh, we get these, so we get the Derek Lay series sort of, um, you know, again, by looking like very carefully at like this sort of prime splitting behavior, um, we end up constructing these things called Hassan invariants. Like, maybe I won't go down that whole rabbit hole, but if you like kind of look up Hassan invariants, it has something to do with um, sort of the properties I mentioned earlier coming from class field theory that we needed to be true in order to actually like get the properties we wanted for our quaternion algebras. Um, and so, it, I mean, it ended up being kind of like, yeah, I guess I'll just say that like constructing the Dear Clay series was a very uh, kind of algebraic and, uh, you know, combinatorial type of argument, but we never actually had to like look at Mellon transforms or anything. And I have no idea if, if you know, there is something nice there. Um, yeah, it's a good question, but I, I really don't know. Okay. But yeah, there's a whole like, uh, Actually, one thing I'm meaning to post on my website, I gave like an introductory talk for a bunch of geometers that was basically like, how do you construct a Dirac Clay series that counts things? Because some people in geometry were interested in sort of knowing what we did in our paper here. Um, and so one thing that I work out actually, and maybe I'll just post this on my website, is I work out like a toy example where it's a little bit simpler than um, what we're counting. I don't actually put all this stuff with the quadratic extension embeddings in there. We're just counting division algebras with discriminant up to a certain bound. And, uh, you know, maybe there is one other, or there's something in there about the dimension. I think we had some conditions on the dimension. But anyway, so like we, I basically scaled down some of the properties and I work out in detail, like in a, you know, hour long talk. Um, in slides, like how to actually do that. And so if you're curious to see how the Dirac Clay series is constructed, I can send you an email once I put these slides on my website and you can check it out. And that will give you like a flavor for what's done. And then of course, if you wanna see what's really done, you can check out the paper, but it's like many, many pages of like very nasty computations. Um, like the, the stuff that we do to construct the Dirac Clay series is actually like not very nice at all. Um, just in terms just, of yeah, it it feels, I don't know, you're asymptotic and like the, when you translate it over to get this like uh, bound, it seems kind of so nice, like so kind of striking that it's it's related to, or it looks similar to to things that do come from like nice smell and transforms that. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I was quite surprised by well, when we actually saw what our order of magnitude was, I was actually, you know, like really interested in, in you know, cause I, I actually, I had several things that have come up in my research that involve this order of magnitude X over log X. And so I'm always really interested when I see X over log X as an order of magnitude, I'm like, ooh, you know, what other things does it have in common with the prime numbers? And so. Um, that was that was where that last little addendum, like the bounded gaps thing, is a separate paper from the rest of this. But it was something that like occurred to us as we were writing the first paper, and then we just kind of thought, "Huh, that would be fun to play with. Let's try it out." Yeah. Uh, do you have any like functional equation or analytic continuum? Yeah, I would guess that would be the first. Yeah, the those would be those would be natural, natural things. To, you would you could try converse theorems or something, but yeah. 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 I'm not sure that it's like interesting enough on its own to like explore like, you know, this Dirac Clay series in so much detail, unless there's like, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but um, you know, in terms of getting the geometric results we cared about, it didn't seem like it was, you know, that it, there was nothing geometrically motivating that, that would make us do that, but maybe it is interesting on its own, I'm not sure. Um, it just, the entire time we were doing this, we were always like, okay, what do we want to do on the geometric side? That's what's motivating every action we do in this paper, you know? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah, but maybe you're right. Maybe it would be nice to explore the Dear Clay series a bit more. Good, uh, good th thoughts for future inquiry, perhaps. Yeah. Um, any other questions? I wonder, doesn't Sage have some, oh no, never mind. You have to know the functional equation. Yeah, I don't know how you like, it's probably like super hard to find. If it has a function, it's probably pretty difficult to determine if it has a nice function, like a nice analytic continuation. Yeah, I wouldn't think it would be super simple. Yeah. I'm wrong.
Well, all right, if there um, are no other questions, let's thank Lola again. And yeah.